Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to you wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this special Ally Week edition of the NAFA webinar series. Um, for uh, this week, we are exploring a variety of aspects of allyship, how others show up for fat community and how we show up for marginalized folks in and out of fat community. Today, we're joined by three fantastic business folks who are gonna to talk to us about best practices and supporting fat business and supporting fat customers. Before we get into our subject today, for those of you who are new to NAFA, we are the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, a five decade plus um, old fat rights organization. To learn more about the rest of our Ally Week offerings and the other work that we do towards equality at every size, please visit us at nafa.org, N-A-A-F-A.org, or follow us on your favorite social media at NAFA Official. Um, in addition to our speakers today, we are joined by the fantastic team from Pro Bono ASL. Uh, today, our interpreters are Artie and Selena. To learn more about the services that Pro Bono ASL offers and to support their work, please check them out at probonoasl.com. And although we are gathering in digital space, we do want to acknowledge the physical spaces we all occupy and the indigenous and the indigenous people who originally stewarded these spaces. I am coming to you this evening from the greater Phoenix area, specifically the land of the O'odam. And I'm gonna ask each of our speakers as I introduce them to tell you a little bit about where they're coming to you from. We're also going to each tell you just a little bit about what people are seeing so that those of you who may be listening and not watching the webinar um, can feel a sense of, of space and environment along with the rest of us. So again, I'm Tigris Osborne, the chair of NAFA, and I am uh, a fat, black, mixed race, cisgender woman with fluffy curly hair in an updo and dark glasses. I'm sitting in a room with a blue wall behind me and the NAFA logos on the wall. Uh, and first I would, um, like to introduce you all to Lindley Ashline. Uh, Lindley creates photographs that celebrate the unique beauty of bodies that fall outside of conventional beauty standards. She fights weight stigma by giving fat people a safe, a safe place to explore how their bodies look on camera and by increasing the representation of fat bodies in photography, advertising, fine art, and the world at large. Lindley is also the creator of Body Liberation Stock and Body uh, stock photos and the Body Love Shop, a curated resource for body friendly products and artwork. You can find Lindley's work and get her free weekly body liberation guide at bit.ly slash body liberation guide. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash body liberation guide. Lindley, where are you tonight and um, what's your environment? Uh, I live outside Seattle, Washington, and that's where I am right now. Uh, I live and work on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. And I'm really grateful both for this land and for these people. And I support the Tribal Council every month uh, at Real Rent Duwamish. And I, uh, I encourage everybody else to as well. Uh, I am a fat cisgender white woman with pink hair and glasses. And I'm wearing a maroon shirt with a strappy top. I'm sitting in my home office uh, with a desk and plants and a bookshelf and a big bulletin board behind me. Thanks, Lindley. Next, I'd like to introduce you all to Laura Burns. Laura Burns is a body liberation activist, yoga teacher, author, and, and I already said activist, sorry. <laughs> She supports folks on their journey to embodiment and healing with yoga classes, workshops, and retreats around the world. Her passion is helping people heal from the damaging effects of body shame, oppression, and capitalism so they can live the life they deserve. You can find more information about Laura and her work at radicalbodylove.com. Laura, will you tell us uh, where you are and what things look like around you tonight? Hi. Uh, so I am zooming in from Houston, Texas, which is the land of the Sana and Karankawa people. And um, I am a fat Asian cisgender woman. I have short black hair with bangs and I'm wearing a blue tie-dye t-shirt sitting in my office, which is very uh, light 
gray colored with some colorful art in the background. Thanks, Laura. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce you all to Dahlia Kinsey. Dahlia is a queer, small fat, black registered dietitian, the creator of, body liber of the Body Liberation for All podcast, and author of Decolonizing Wellness, a QTBIPOC centered guide to escape the diet trap, heal your self image and achieve body liberation. Dahlia rejects diet culture and teaches people to use nutrition as self care and, and a personal empowerment tool to counter the damage of systemic oppression. Dahlia's work can be found at dahliakinsey.com. Welcome Dahlia, will you tell us uh, where you are and what things look like around you? Yes, I'm in Griffin, Georgia, that's about an hour south of Atlanta, and this is Muskogee Creek Nation land. Uh, now, the Muskogee Nation is pretty much headquartered in Oklahoma because of their being forcibly removed from here, but still there are some people remaining here. I am, like you said, a small black fat woman well, femme presenting person, actually non-binary with black glasses. I have small dreadlocks. I'm wearing a blue pullover sweater. I'm sitting in front of a bookcase in, in a room with light walls with a large wall print of the cover of Decolonizing Wellness behind me. And, um, and coming up in February, we're going to be uh, giving away a copy of Dahlia's book. So stay tuned to uh, the NAFA blog and NAFA.org um, for more information about that. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Let's go ahead and get into our content. Um, so let's just start by having you tell, having each of you tell us a little bit about your, your journey as a, as a fat business owner, um, how you got started, how it's going, and, um, and what learnings you have to share about what what our community could be doing to support business leaders better. Um, Lindley, let's start with you. Oh, I feel like this is uh, an hour's worth of <laughs> an hour's worth of background in, in, in just a minute. But uh, but very briefly, uh, I had been a member of the fat acceptance and fat activist community, uh, but wasn't really doing any activism of my own uh, for about 10 years before I started my business. And when I began my photography business, I knew that I wanted to work with fat folks. And, uh, and like most people here, I do use the word fat as a neutral descriptor uh, rather than you know, a, loaded, a loaded comment. But, uh, but I knew that I wanted to work with fat folks. And so I built fat acceptance and fat activism into the very foundation of my business. And, and so that has been, as a business owner, really cool because it meant that I never had to go back and retrofit. Um, unlike you know, most people are going to have to consider how they might incorporate that into their existing businesses if it wasn't something they were previously aware of. And right. so, uh, so it's been really cool to be able to both demonstrate that that is possible uh, and the practical ways that you can do that uh, in my own business, even as I'm helping other people learn to do that as well. That's a really great intro and we'll get to some of those practical ways in just a minute. Um, Laura, will you tell us how you got started? Yes, it was an accident. <laughs> so I never meant to become a yoga teacher. Uh, in fact, when I was younger, I tried yoga and I hated it because I didn't know what to do with my fat body. And of course the blame was directed at me. And then I internalized that of course, because that's what we're taught to do. Um, so I became one by accident. I was trying to convince all my friends to start teaching yoga for fat people and nobody would do it. And so uh, I was like, fine. And so I took the training and I just really fell in love with the possibilities of helping to bring the benefits that yoga and everything that comes along with that, right? Not just the physical postures, but everything that comes along with that, the embodiment work, the self-care, the healing, um, what that can do for people who have lived in marginalized bodies, um, because I saw what it did for me. Um, so then I was a yoga teacher <laughs> and it's been uh, really amazing and enlightening. Um, sometimes I run into people who knew me like in high school and I tell them what I do and they literally laugh in my face because I was so vehemently like anti 
yoga and like the yoga industrial complex. Um, so I really feel like, you know, my job is to make these kind of spaces um, not only accessible, but inclusive and encouraging for people in all kinds of bodies. Um, and not just the ones that you see like in you know, yoga journal, uh, but that's really evolved over time. And the yoga classes are one piece of it. And now it's become so much more about body liberation work in a more um, holistic, like comprehensive way, because um, when people start to find it, they want more and more. Um, and so basically what I found is all this stuff that I had to figure out, um, before there was like Instagram and the, you know, the body positive movement and all that stuff. Like um, I'm just helping to kind of pull that all together and, and help people get access to that in a way that's easier than having to like search high and low, you know, to find people that you can trust that aren't like secretly trying to undermine you or scam you or, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, so here I am and it continues to evolve and uh, we'll see. What's next? I don't know. <laughs> okay, we'll um, well maybe we can talk a little bit about what might be what might be next. Um, Dahlia, what about you? How did you get started? So I started out with wanting to work with women and children, anyone who was at risk of being malnourished or having some kind of nutrition related disease. And so I decided to become a registered dietitian, which was so the process was horrible, horrible. Like the microaggressions, the fat phobia, the racism, the homophobia, it was horrific. So for a while, I felt like I didn't know which direction I wanted to head with my training. And I had a lot of false starts with my business. So I would try to create safer containers, but I wasn't explicitly focusing on marginalized bodies. And I kept finding that people who didn't belong would come in with their toxic diet culture trash. And so over time, I've finally understood that you have to center your values because if you don't and you kind of softly try to explain that intersectionality is a must, people will not get it. So you have to be polarizing if you're going to support people in marginalized bodies because people are so committed to their biases. And it's taken me years to get that clarity and to have the backbone to put myself out there in that way. And when I started in the field, I was in a smaller body and because of chronic illnesses that I have, my body has changed and it goes up and down and all around because of the illness. But I've also had to deal with a lot of criticism and undermining in addition to people assuming that femme presenting people don't know anything and black people don't know anything and people in larger bodies don't know anything. Especially and in your field. It's yes. Like, yeah. So I had a lot of fear around if I really center what I believe is right. And I know is more evidence-based how much of a personal attack on a daily basis type of situation is that going to be? So it just took me a while to work through that and realize that it's more important to me to create safer spaces for other people, because I'm not experiencing nearly the amount of abuse that people who are super fat or are in a body where you go into any healthcare setting and it is just not friendly or set up for you. It was more important to me to focus on the people that were experiencing the harm than trying to protect myself from criticism. So let's talk about, um, all of you have said something about the values that you bring to your business. Um, certainly there are fat people running businesses who aren't thinking about those values. As Lindley said, you know, you set up a, a business that is very specific to, um, to reaching fat folks. What are some of the things that you thought about in doing that? What are some of the practical things that you had to you know, that you had to consider in your marketing, in your, in your business setup, any of those areas? And, and you can just jump right in. 
Yeah, for me, it was, uh, it started right away because as a, I had been doing photography for a long time, but I had never been photographing people. And so I needed a portfolio if I was going to sell client photography sessions. I needed to, you know, show what I could do. So after I did some training around portrait and boudoir photography and working with bodies, um, and I had to seek out, uh, you know, the few resources that were available at the time for posing larger bodies, for working with larger bodies. Um, and so that was a challenge right off. But, you know, I discovered that uh, when you, posts that you're looking for models, the people who are going to be the most available um, simply because statistically they're paid more, have more free time, are the people in the most privileged bodies in general, not just body size, but all kinds of different privileges that we might hold. Uh, and so I had to very specifically, um, I got on Craigslist, honestly, uh, to look for models. And I very specifically said that I'm looking for people over a certain clothing size. And I was afraid that I wasn't going to get anyone, <laughs> uh, but I did, I got responses. Um, I was especially worried about reaching out to marginalized people when I didn't have any previous work that they could look and see that I was reputable and could be trusted. And right. so those first few people really took a leap of faith in responding to me. <laughs> And I had to make, I had to make sure I had to be very careful. I mean, then and now, um, but particularly when I didn't have any sort of online presence that people could look at, I had to be very careful to be extra specially open, ethical, honest in my dealings um, so that people could trust me enough to walk into my home and be photographed. Um, right. And, and that sort of set that. Uh, that baseline. Uh, because when I am working with marginalized people, um, that's the very least that I need to be doing. Uh, but, but holding myself to those standards and to treating every single person's body with care and respect and, you know, and, and that holding space for that vulnerability, because I had to start doing that right away, I mean, that is ideally something that I want to do no matter what, but I was forced to start doing that right away. And it was a good you know, a, a good baseline. And so, so when I talk about building it in, um, that's what I mean, because if I was going to photograph fat folks, I didn't want a portfolio full of, of very thin people, because that's not representative of the, the, the clients that I wanted. So both from a, uh, an, uh, maybe an equity standpoint or a representation standpoint, but also a business standpoint, I had to be coherent with that right from the start. What about um, the other two of you? What do you, what what are some of the things that you had to think about in being intentional about creating a safe space for fat folks? Yeah. Um, so you know something that Lindley said is something that I think is probably integral to all of our work, which is people really have to put their trust in us. Like that's a big responsibility to hold, um, and sometimes it's really scary. <laughs> um, in the beginning, kind of similar to Lindley, but kind of a different side of the coin is that um, as a yoga instructor for my intended audience was fat people, right? Um, and how do you market a class when what you usually see in advertising is thin, white, rich bodies, right? And I don't wanna use any of that kind of imagery in my work, but it's also to me not ethical to take photos of my students um, or even really to put that on them to like, oh, can I take a picture of you in class? Like for me personally, like that's not okay. So um, I really had trouble finding people who were willing to come to it like a fake class so I could, you know, teach you and photograph you and even just getting people because we have been so used to have been like, you know, being taken advantage of and being, you know, mocked and, and stuff like that. So it's very challenging to want to put yourself out there. So in the beginning, I realized that um, while it's important to me to put images of a fat body in my marketing material so people know that it's really for them, I realized that it was going to have to be my body 
that I put in the materials. And so that's why my logo is of my whole body with my big old belly and, you know, like a realistic, not like, you know, idealized uh, drawing, rendering of a photo. Um, and so like from the beginning, I just realized that it was my responsibility to put myself in that position of being perceived and seen and potentially reacted to in many kinds of ways, which, you know, has happened. Um, and so I've had other businesses before. This is the first one that had all these different considerations. And so it was really like, oh, okay, <laughs> like this is going to be a different kind of experience. Um, but I've learned so much and I still, um, it's still important to me to have fat bodies in the marketing um, and have gotten used to it just being my body because I still am in kind of the same opinion um, about the other things. And um, luckily, plug for Lindley's work, luckily I've been able to purchase beautiful stock photos from Lindley's website that have a diversity of bodies in, you know, active wear, potentially doing yoga things. That's been really helpful, but like that resource didn't exist when I was first starting. So um, being able, number one, to like go, oh, I need to spend money on something for marketing. Let me give Lindley this money. And also Lindley's the only one doing it that I know of. Um, it's just like really amazing to be able to support other businesses. And so that's also what I try to do. Um, when I have to spend money for the business, if I can give it to somebody who also shares the same values, that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, I would so much rather, you know, kick money the direction of somebody who I can feel really like proud of supporting than a company that I'm like, oh my God, I hate giving you money, but here you go. <laughs> um, Cause like, that's how we reinforce and build our community. Um, that's how we're able to have companies like these and people um, doing this work. The yes. good news is that there's a lot more people starting to do things like this now, yes. um, but we still have a long way to go. And I don't know if we'll talk about this later, but just throwing it out that like, even just paying people for their time, like shout out to NAFA, thanks for paying us. Because a lot of people don't wanna pay us to do things like this too. And, 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 you know, full disclosure, that's a relatively new thing for NAFA. We've, for most of our history, been an all volunteer organization, um, you know, with, with people paid for service in some ways, but most of the work being done by volunteers. And there are times when that's appropriate. We want to show up and give of our time, but also there are times when people can't. And it meant exactly what Lindley talked about, where if you only take people who, um, for whom it is the easiest to do it, then you only get like certain demographics of people being represented. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a really important point, Laura, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, Dahlia, what about you? Some of the specific things that you had to consider in being intentional? Really making sure that I came right out and said repeatedly in my marketing that I'm anti-diet so that anyone who wanted to come in and low key diet, because you see a lot of people who do bod pause, but at the same time are low key trying to sell you like a health, they just code it differently, but it's still about shrinking the body in order to keep those people out of the space. I have to keep saying, have to keep saying it. And I have had trouble with finding stock images that you know, things have changed so much over the last, what, 10 years. You used to have to pay for like all stock photos, but now there are lots of different sites where stock photos are free. However, if you want something specific, if you want something that's not generic, you're going to need to actually purchase those. Because when I want something intersectional, like I want a fat, not white body in an image, it's darn near impossible to find. And if you do, it's certainly not in the light that you were looking for. And there's never smiling, never happy. The only people who are smiling are people with a bowl of salad. And that's not what I want. So Lily's at the top of my wish list because just like Laura said, spending money in your community to me is very important. And that's one of the things I'm doing in 2022 is if I cannot find a marginalized person offering the service and I need it, okay, fine. But my money is first going to someone who is part of the community or dedicated to the community and doing that work. 
And it sometimes, and usually mostly is going to mean you're going to need to pay more because large corporations don't pay people fair wages and they do things on such a massive scalable colonizer type of way that you can give people these low prices. So that's something that I think is also difficult for people who are both marginalized and wanting to support their own marginalized people is yes. that sometimes you feel torn between like, oh, I want the cheaper option, but I want to spend money in our community. So it's been helpful for me to just clearly state that's a value for myself and for my business. And basically there's no division between me and my business because my values and the business, that's why the business exists for me to bring my values into the world and just not being cheap and understanding that it is toxic capitalism that makes you think you should always go for the lowest bidder. Well, and it's really, as, as we consider allyship throughout this week in our various workshops, it is one of the things that um, we want people to be thinking about. If you have privilege, how are you using it? And if you have economic privilege, one of the things you can be doing is, uh, you know, is spending the money even when it's more expensive. There are people who literally cannot do that. The, the only option is to buy the, to do the cheapest thing, right? But if you're not one of those people, then how are you thinking about um, applying your, your values to what you buy. Um, and I'm sure y'all have some things, more things to say about that. Lindley, yeah. I saw you raise your hand. Uh, just since, since Dahlia and Laura had both brought up the stock photos that I create, um, this is a really great example of uh, using your buying power as a business owner to support other marginalized people. Um, and also of deliberately incorporating your values into how you run your business. Uh, so, all the models who appear in my stock photos, um, they can choose whether they want to be compensated in money, an hourly living wage, um, or images. And, uh, and they are also, if they choose money, but they want to keep some of the images, I sell those at an extremely low, like a model rate for those, those folks, uh, so that they can do both if they want to. But, uh, but paying your models um, when I started getting into photography communities was pretty much unheard of. Um, like models just don't get paid. And part of that is because, uh, and now I'm talking about people who are working with primarily amateur and semi-professional models. If somebody is represented by a model agency, they're probably getting paid. Um, but, but there are so many folks who do want to see themselves represented, who want that experience of being on camera, that there's a lot of free, there's a big pool of free labor out there that someone who wanted to take advantage of that could do. Um, and many, many, many photographers do. And so I had to deliberately set my intention that I'm going to pay my models. I'm going to compensate people. Um, and it's, the thing is that so many of my models are multiply marginalized. Um, you know, they're, they're fat black queer folks, or they are trans folks, or they are um, you know, all kinds of marginalization combinations. And that means that for them, they might not be able to see themselves represented uh, to come and participate if I'm not compensating them so that they can get there. Um, and, and, you know, and I, I will give people rides and so on too, but, but just, it was something that I had to choose right away because I could have chosen to say, oh, I'm selling these diverse stock photos and then not pay my models in the background. And that would have been a pretty crappy way to do this if I'm going to talk the talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, and so I had to choose to be coherent. And if you are a business owner, um, as you start being aware, you will find more and more places where you have those choices. And yeah. Oh, what God. about... Um, what about using the word fat in your promotions? Obviously we're in a space here where everybody uses the word fat. NAFA's used it for 50 years in, in our name. You all have used it in your businesses and you've you know used it in your personal lives. When you use it to market your business, how does that affect you? What are the positive effects of it and what are the challenges of it? So I'll jump in. I have from the beginning used fat 
uh, when I talk about myself and I talk about who like my people are, my students are. Um, and I, in the beginning, it was kind of scary because, you know, I was newer, hadn't been doing this so long. I was on, you know, my foundation felt a little, a little rocky, a little shaky. Um, and I would get these people who felt very entitled to really dig in and poke because it triggered something in them to hear that. And they would then, you know, like attack me about it. Um, and I have learned over time really, I mean, I always knew, but like I, now I really know if that makes sense. Um, it's not about me and it's not about my use of the word fat. It's about their own stuff that they have not dealt with. Um, and so what I realized pretty quickly was by using the word fat, the right people who needed to be here now would find their way to me. And the people that weren't ready or who weren't right for it would not come. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saw that time and time again, people would come and they'd be like, oh, I don't, you know, like I don't, if they mentioned it, they'd say, oh, I don't use that word. It's like, okay, that's cool. You don't have to. I don't like use the time in class just to talk about like fat, 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 you know, like whatever, but I do use the word. But what I realized is that there's people who are kind of very new for whom this might not be the right class for them. Um, I personally really don't like euphemisms. I, they really bother me because that's all I got growing up <laughs> It's like, you know, and I was taught that that's what I should want. And so now I don't want it. And so I'm not going to use it. And um, I think with any job that you have, any business that you have, the best thing you can do is just be who you are because the people that are right for you are going to find you. And there are a lot, many of us out there and you're going to find the right person for you. There's very like what, you know, woo woo teachers. And like, that's not who I am. You know, and so people who want that kind of experience, which I totally get, they're going to come to my class once and be like, this was not right for me. And then some people are going to go to the other class and go, oh, this is not right for me. You know, so we just, I, I think that I learned exist how I am, just be who I am and the right people are going to find me. Um, and that really has just been like what I've lived by in terms of like using the word fat and being unapologetically anti-diet and anti-intentional weight loss and pro fat bodies and like, you know, built around, you know, the principles of like loving fat, but I love fat bodies. I love fat people. And like, we deserve so much and we get shit on, you know? And like, there's a lot of people doing all the other stuff and there's not a lot of people doing this. And so I want to just like really stay in my little lane, you know, and just be who I am and use the words that I want to use. Um, I did want to speak to you really quick talking about like um, people with privilege and how we can, as business owners and as people who are customers of businesses, when we have privilege, especially financial privilege, um, one of the things that I did from the beginning is offer sliding scale, which um, I don't have a bottom for my sliding scale. So the bottom is zero dollars and zero cents. Um, and sometimes that's been hard when I have more people on the sliding scale or the lower end of the sliding scale, but excess, I don't make a lot of money. I never had a lot of money. It's really important. Would I be able to take my class? Would I be able to attend my retreat? If the answer is no, that's a problem, you know, cause like we deserve access to these things. So one of the best things that I did is I switched to a different system of like booking classes after the pandemic and everything changed, we went from in-person to only online, which is like a whole other thing. Um, I switched to using Patreon to like manage who gets access to classes. And I created a higher tier that's like a sustainer level tier. And there are people who can afford it, who choose to pay a monthly rate that is higher than everybody else. And that has been so helpful. And it, like they feel good, like they're able to help more people are able to take advantage of the sliding scale or coming to class for free. And it's easier on me to be able to offer those things. So yes. um, I just really recommend that to people. And when I've talked about that before, um, people are like, well, you know, this is my livelihood. I can't just like, this is my livelihood. This is not a side hustle or a hobby. Like this is my job. So like, you can do it. You can choose to do it. And sometimes those choices like suck a little bit, you know, maybe I don't make as money as I, as much money as I could, but like, if 
feels good to know that I'm doing what I can, you know? So. Yeah. And what folks, we um, will have time for one or two questions from, from the chat. Um, and while you queue those up, go ahead and put those in the chat if there's something you're thinking of. Dahlia, what about you? How, how do you use the word fat with your clients? I really don't because the people I'm dealing with typically have, they're very early on in their body acceptance. And I like what, what Laura was saying resonates with me so much, because if you don't want a client who is at that stage, you really need to make it clear who you're for and who's not ready for you. Like I go to a class called fat girl yoga and that marketing appealed to me right away. Cause I'm thinking the modifiers are actually going to be there. I'm not going to have to walk all the way to the front to get the block. But I know that there would be some people who are still so self-conscious about their body. They would never go. And then I also felt a little like, I want to stay in my lane as a small fat. I don't want to feel like I'm taking up space that is probably for somebody who's experiencing more oppression in relation to their body size. And I focus a little more on what is my actual lived experience while trying to create safer spaces for people who are at that intersection of, you know, fatness and queerness and being a POC. Thanks. What about you, Lindley? I don't think you answered this one. I think we jumped off of something you were saying for this one. Um, how has it helped you or created challenges for you that you explicitly use the word fat in your business? Uh, like Laura, I think it has, the more explicit that I have been, the more that I have, uh, I have clients come to me who are, uh, <laughs> who are ready for this. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. um, because I do, I started out in my business marketing, uh, much less radical than I actually am in my beliefs about bodies, uh, because I was worried that nobody would, would want to come to the raging fire brand for photos. And, and, and so what happened is I was attracting people who were not ready for the services I was providing and it ended up being a really unpleasant experience for both of us because they felt uh, they felt like they were not like their bodies were being treated with with more honesty than they were ready for uh, because I don't Photoshop people. And, and so I had a few folks come in who were not ready for that. They weren't ready to see their bodies with that level of honesty. The, and they had somehow gotten the impression because I was not clear enough that they were gonna be getting an experience like traditional photographers give where they're getting photoshopped and they're getting slimmed down and they're getting a, a tummy tuck and a, a, a butt tuck or whatever. And that they're gonna have China doll skin, you know, and I don't do any of that. And so, so I had to be more and more explicit about the terms I'm using and what I'm offering and how I talk about bodies so that customers are getting a good experience. Clients are getting a good experience. And I, as a business owner, am having a good time <laughs> because, because, you know, I don't, I came from a corporate background. I don't have to do this. I'm here because, and, and again, this is my day job. This is not a hobby. It's not a side gig. It's not a side hustle. Um, this is my day job. Um, but you know, if I'm not, if I'm miserable, I can go back to the corporate world and be miserable there. So, so it is important to be coherent with myself as a business owner too. Um, but the more explicit that I am, the more people know what they're getting into. And, and like Dahlia was saying, the folks who are not ready for that can safely self-select out. And I refer people out all the time, uh, you know, where people who are like, I'm looking for somebody who's body positive. And that's fine. I have a whole guide on my site on how to find a photographer that's a good fit for you at wherever point you're at, how to look, how to look at language, how to look at portfolios. So, so yeah, that was absolutely essential for me uh, to, so that for my own care and the care of my clients. 
Bill from Ample Stuff says, I love our Ample Stuff customers, even those for whom the word fat is still very painful. Should we in business be flexible about the terms and the politics? Um, for example, saying people of size or larger persons plus size and so forth. Um, Bill says now and then he speaks in fat um, as though that's normal to everyone else, as though that's typical for everyone else to speak in, um, in fat activist jargon, if you will. Um, should we be flexible? It sounds like most of you have said you should follow your values and that that's what's right for your customers. Do you have anything to add to that? I do. I actually think, um, so I said all the things that I said for me. I think in Bill's example with Ample stuff, I think it makes sense. The people who are coming there, um, I think I'm familiar with the company that you are. People are coming there to look for things that can help them live their lives um, in comfort and with dignity, if I'm thinking of the right place. Um, and a lot of times people are maybe not ready to like just have fat everywhere, but they also need to feel safe and comfortable to get the things that they need to live their life. Um, and so I think that there are circumstances when it's okay not to push it. Um, and like, for me, it doesn't feel right, but like in a circumstance like that, whether it's this company or another one, I want people to be able to find what they need. And if the search terms that they're using, you know, fall into this other category, then I want them to find that stuff there, you know, or if buying from a business that feels safe and comfortable, um, you know, if those words need to be used there instead of something that feels more jarring or even like aggressive to them, like fat, like how it might. Um, I don't know. I just think about access and how when I was much earlier in my like fat liberation journey, um, what I felt safe and comfortable with was so much smaller and it would have potentially kept me from getting what I needed. Um, and so that's what I think about when I, when I hear that question. So, I mean, I think when you're like a person like we are, you know, like we're one person, we are our brand, basically, it's a little different. Um, but I, yeah, anyway, it's not across the board, unilateral for everyone. And you are thinking of the the right company, Laura, Ample Stuff sells a wide variety of um, practical things, sometimes fun things too, but practical things that that fat people need um, that are that are made for higher weight people or larger size, larger bodied people. Mm -hmm. um, so th so you've, you've got the right company in mind. Um, what let's let's end by having you each say one thing that you think other businesses could be doing better for fat customers. Um, that can be sort of a philosophical thing or a practical thing, but if there are folks watching who are thinking about starting a new business or who are already running a business and may not be fat themselves, what are they? What, what do they need to do for their fat customers? And we'll just, we'll go alphabetically again, because I oh. seem to keep landing on mostly alphabetically with y'all. So um, uh, Lindley Ashline, what do, what do What's your advice for other business owners? Oh, all right. A quick one uh, for brick and mortar and then online. So uh, brick and mortar chairs that we can sit in. Chairs, C-H-A-I-R-S. <laughs> um, if you don't have any armless chairs in your office or lobby or waiting room or examination room or whatever your brick and mortar space is, put an armless one in there. Give us something. Uh, give, if there's no room for anything, give us a stool. Um, you can probably do better than that, but if, if that's all you can fit in, do that. Um, if you have the luxury of options, have a, the widest chair you can find with arms, have one with no arms and have a love seat or something for the, the, the people who, because that helps uh, all kinds of different people who have different mobility needs. Yes. Um, and then if, you're, if your business is, is strictly online, Yes, I'm biased because I'm very passionate about this because it's what I do, uh, but represent fat folks in your marketing. Get some big bodies in there. It's not gonna hurt you. You're not allergic. <laughs> not allergic. But, but represent but allergic, us. You shouldn't be serving fat them. customers anyway. <laughs> Sorry, digress. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. I was just saying, if you are allergic, if, if you are allergic, you, you're not the one to be serving fat customers oh, anyway, that's, right? That's true, that's true, that's true. <laughs> Uh, but but if you want to get fat customers in your door, represent us. 
show us in your environment, show us buying your widgets, you know, get us in there. Laura, thank you, Lindley. Laura. Oh, so many answers. You know, what came to mind first is the one I'm just going to say is um, be open to messing up and to learning from your mistakes. Be open to listening to the feedback from your customers or clients or, or whatever, because um, we are human beings and we're going to mess up and we're going to do it wrong and we might do it wrong again. But the in my life, what I've learned is be open to, you know, hopefully loving, compassionate, constructive criticism, because um, we should always be trying to do better for the people who are giving us their trust and their hard earned money. <laughs> um, and I don't know, like we have a responsibility as business owners to people that are, you know, giving these things to us um, and trusting us. So everybody messes up, allow yourself to mess up, learn from it and, you know, just try to do better. Thank you, Laura. And Dahlia, what about you? Don't try to fake inclusion and hype up like, oh, our, our sizing, it's so ample and that stops at 3X. You know, that really pay attention, pay attention to what people are saying who are leading the way with fat acceptance and activism and see whether or not what you think is enough matches what people who are actually in these bodies say is enough and stop pretending these folks are not there. Like with the seats, that's so obvious, but people don't even want to look at fat people sometimes. So they won't notice how many people just kind of have to stand in the waiting room, pay attention and give people respect and listen to them and give them an anonymous way to give you feedback. And think seriously about whether or not you should offer a product at all if it is not going to be accessible to most people. Like I understand with some things, it's impossible to make something that is going to work for everyone. But are you just out here doing the least, but then in your marketing pretending like everyone can see through that and that's a waste of your time and that's a waste of the consumer's time. Thank you all for those, um, for those practical tips, for the value-based um, approach that you bring to your businesses, and for being here with us today. Um, let's have each of you just remind folks where they can find you if they want to learn more from you or support your business. Lindley? I I unmute myself. I'm at bodyliberationphotos.com. You can find everything that I do there. I'm also on Instagram at Body Liberation with Lindley, L-I-N-D-L-E-Y. And as we mentioned earlier, you can get my weekly newsletter at bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Body Liberation Guide. Thanks, Lindley. Laura? You can um, find links to everything on my website, which is radicalbodylove.com. That's also my Instagram Instagram name at radicalbodylove. Um, and since we're here, I just want to hold up to the camera. You know what's coming. This is my book. It came out last year. It's yoga for actual fat people. It's called for the plus size woman. Ignore that. My, it was the publisher. We had to do it. It's for everybody. It's for all fat bodies. So... Thank you, Laura. And we can buy your book through your website. Uh, you can get it like a seller. Yeah, anywhere books are sold. Um, please support independent booksellers, especially those who support us. If there's someone locally that you know who does a great job of stocking books by fat people and about and for fat people, uh, please shout them out in the chat. Um, Dahlia, what about you? Where can folks find you? DahliaKinsey.com because... I recently was kicked off of Instagram. So you can find me there. <laughs> That's the best place. And I do spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. And it sounds like Lindley and Laura have Patreons, right? So we can find y'all on Patreon too. I recently have started joining Patreons because I realized how much work it takes to create content. And even if you just give a dollar, that's better than the $0 you get for posting all kinds of great content on Instagram. 
<laughs> Thank you for that pro tip as well, Dahlia. Um, and of course, we um, we want y'all to think about how you can support pro bono ASL. Um, we do pay for services from pro bono ASL, and we do that out of an ethic of being able to help support them in offering pro bono services to others in need who cannot pay for them. So um, we encourage you to support their work in whatever ways you can. And thank you for those of, uh, of you who support our work, because that's what allows us to do that. We are primarily, as I said earlier, an all uh, a volunteer organization organization with all volunteer leadership. And, um, and, and we are able to offer these webinars free to the community because of the support of folks like you. So if you would like to support us, please visit nafa.org, N-A-A-F-A.org, and click the Give to NAFA button. Um, coming up later this week, uh, we have more dialogue around inclusivity, particularly some of the questions that came up about um, using terms or what Dahlia mentioned about business that use the term inclusive and then only go up to certain sizes. Um, Marcy Cruz, our director of fashion industry relations, will be uh, talking to Sarah from Curvely about being a smaller fat person and how you can leverage your power in plus size community to um, make it actually more inclusive in plus size fashion for people who are larger fats. And then Saucy West will be joining us to talk about her fight for inclusivity campaign, which also looks at pressuring companies that serve plus size, uh, particularly plus size women in femmes fashion to, um, to expand their sizing or to stop using the word inclusive because it's a lie. Um, so please uh, join us for those things. We have several other Ally Week events uh, still to come. Visit our website and click on the Ally Week uh, tab for a list of those events. Thank you once again for being with us this evening and this whatever part of the day it is, wherever you are, and take care, everyone. We'll see you next time.